Majesty's loyal opposition. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Last month, the Premier told AM640 that his government considered buying back Highway 407. I, I got to tell you, this was surprising, Speaker, because this same government, his government, the Premier, voted against our motion to remove tolls for truckers on the 407. So we wanted to find out a little bit more about that, and we filed a Freedom of Information request for the government's studies and their assessments of this Highway 407 buyback idea, and uh, turns out there aren't any. No studies, no assessments, nothing. The Ministry of Transportation was unable to find a single record showing that the government had ever considered buying back Highway 407. So why did the Premier make this claim? And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our government has a plan to build. It has a plan to build highways across this province, whether that's the Highway 413, whether that's uh, the Bradford Bypass, Highway 7, Mr. Speaker. And we have a plan. We've removed tolls off the 412 and 418 that, unfortunately, the Liberals uh, put in place and the NDP supported to keep in place until this Premier and our government removed those tolls, uh, Mr. Speaker. We need to continue to expand our capacity across this province, and that is why this government continues to put forward these plans. It's unfortunate that the NDP don't want to support building more highways across this province. There hasn't been a single project that they haven't uh, voted against, Mr. Speaker. We need to get people moving across this province, and we'll continue to come in with a plan that supports the entire province and builds for the future. Supplementary question. I'm not sure that was the an, an answer at all to my question, actually, Speaker. But look, um, <laughs> taking tolls off of trucks on the 407 is is a simple measure that makes a lot of sense and would relieve congestion right away. Uh, but what's good uh, with this government, what's good for people, always seems to take a back seat to the interests of insiders and lobbyists, no matter the cost. We have no costing on Highway 413, no opening date on three major LRT projects, and a $100 billion estimate for a back-of-the-napkin tunnel scheme. Whenever the Premier comes up with some on-the-fly idea, no matter how much it costs, it becomes these ministers and this government's, I guess, responsibility to defend that. So why won't the Premier show people the evidence and costing for his transportation decisions before he spends the people's money? Speaker, here we have the NDP once again. You know, that was the same party that opposed the transit plan that this Premier put to the people of this province six years ago. They called that back in the napkin. Guess what? We've got shovels in the ground on Ontario Line. We've got shovels in the ground on the Scarborough subway extension. We're building LRTs across this province. The NDP lacks a vision for this province. They're no different than the Liberals who for 15 years did absolutely nothing, built absolutely nothing in the province. It's a shame, Mr. Speaker. Order. They will find every excuse in the book to get in the way of building progress for this, for this province. The voters spoke loud and clear when we took uh, these questions uh, to them on June 2, 2022. Those members over there know they lost members in key ridings like Brampton and Peel Region. We swept those ridings. Why? Because they believed in our vision to build highways, to build transit. The NDP is too focused on appeasing special interest groups. They want us to stop building. We won't take any of that. We won't listen to them. We're going to continue to get shovels in the ground and build our transportation projects. The final supplementary. Yeah, here's the thing, um, Speaker. Life in Ontario under this government has never been more expensive or exhausting in our history. Right? Removing truck tolls was just one simple way to save some people time and money, but they voted against it. Order. They voted against it. And it was only when the Premier got any kind of pushback that he said, oh, I'll look into uh, buying back the 407. But our research 
Freedom of Information request shows that never happened. That never happened. Government House Leader, we come to order. We need the Premier to set the record straight and make his choice. Will he stand up for truckers and commuters and remove those costly tolls, or is he going to keep protecting the interests of the private company that runs the 407? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we are standing up for drivers and truckers every single day of the year. Let's look, let's look at the record of the NDP. Voted against removing uh, taxes off of gas. We just what? last week what? extended that uh, through the fall economic statement. Yeah. The NDP has an option to support that measure that has been put into the fall economic statement for an extension. Will they do that? I don't think so, Mr. Speaker, because they voted against it every single time. When we took off $125, uh, the sticker fee on our vehicles, what did the NDP do? They laughed. They didn't support it. They've never had a tax that they haven't supported. Our fight against the carbon tax that punishes hardworking families every single day when they're taking their kids to uh, hockey practice, basketball practice, when they're taking their kids to school. Those members over there have stood. In fact, okay. in fact, they've stood to ask us to increase uh, the carbon tax to the highest we've ever shame. seen it. That's a shame, Mr. Speaker. The NDP don't stand for Order. drivers. The NDP don't stand for building progress in this province. They voted against every single one of those measures. They continue to oppose everything this government does when it comes to building infrastructure, to building transportation. But guess what? We're going to get shovels in the ground. We're going to keep putting more money back in the pockets of hardworking families, and we will build this province for the next 10, 20, 50 years so people can enjoy the infrastructure that we are the next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, the hardworking families that this government likes to talk about have never uh, had to struggle more than they do right now under any previous government. It is unbelievable. So I'm going to go back to the Premier because the evidence that insiders and lobbyists are calling the shots with this government keeps piling up. Yesterday we learned that key emails and records related to the rerouting of the Bradford bypass and all of the associated costs around that are missing. Disappeared. The senior Conservative staffer in question in the Minister of Transportation's office was none other than Ryan Amato. People will remember that name because he's the same former staffer who was, is currently refusing to hand in his emails from the whole Greenbelt affair. So I want to ask the Premier, did staff in the Minister of Transportation's office delete emails? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the Bradford Bypass, Highway 413, Highway 7, our $28 billion plan to build highways was put to the people of this province in the most transparent manner. In fact, those members right there know that very well because they've lost three members of their caucus in Brampton to their opposition to Highway 413. And guess what? They've lost the last three by-elections, and they still haven't learned, Mr. Speaker. Every single time they stand up and oppose progress in this province, it's a shame. We have a plan to build, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan to invest $70 billion over the next 10 years to, take, uh, to build public transit. The Ontario Line will take and move 400,000 people every single day, a line that the people of Toronto have been asking for the for decades. And guess what? Those members over there have voted against it every single time. They want us to go back to the 15 years of the previous Liberal government where they built absolutely government nothing. Side come to order. They gave us the worst gridlock. They left us a bankrupt province. But our government is committed to building. We're committed to building for the next generation, the next 50 years. We have a vision to Response. attract more jobs. We have a vision to continue building. We'll build Highway 413. We're going to build the Bradford Bypass. And we're going to ensure we continue Moving Ontario. The supplementary. Speaker, this is a this is a really important issue, and um, and I'll tell you why. It's because the rerouting of the Bradford Bypass wasn't based on any evidence that anybody can find. But thanks to this government's decisions, the value of certain parcels of land associated with that rerouting suddenly skyrocketed. Land that happened to be owned by some of the same insiders, conservative insiders, that were involved in benefiting from the Greenbelt scheme. In the few records that do exist out there, 
Staff in the Minister of Transportation's office said that this request to look into changing the route came directly from the Premier. Can the Premier clarify what direction he gave to the Minister of Transportation's office? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, let me clarify the direction the people of this province gave this government on June 2, 2022. Build Highway 413 and build the Bradford Bypass. That is exactly what we will do. It doesn't matter, Mr. Speaker, what the NDP or Liberals try to do to oppose that. Every single piece of legislation that we bring forward in this House is to move those projects faster because we know people are stuck in gridlock. We know because of the inaction of the previous Liberal government building nothing in this province for 15 years, no transit, no highways, no roads. It's our, it's our government that's moving forward on this ambitious plan, $100 billion between highways and public transit to build. The NDP and Liberals will oppose it every step of the way, but we're going to continue to get shovels in the ground and we're going to continue to build because Ontario does, uh, asked us to do that. The people of this province asked us to build and that's exactly what we'll continue to deliver on, whether it's the Ontario line, the Scarborough subway extension, Bonds. whether it's Highway 413 or the Bradford bypass, all of those projects are getting built and we're going to get shovels in the ground. The final supplementary. So on this side of the House, we think that transportation decisions should serve the interests of the people, not the interests of the premiers, Order. friends, and donors. Right? That's the thing. It looks like these changes to the Bradford Mr. bypass route were a test drive for the tactics that they Government used House to Leader, try come to, to order. up the green belt. High-ranking staff taking very specific instructions from the premier directly. Major changes in government policy directed, again, by insiders, and all the evidence scrubbed from the record. Yeah. This is the kind of shady business that undermines Ontario's credibility. Speaker, uh, uh, withdrawn. This is the kind of questionable business that undermines Ontario's accountability, undermines the public trust, and it isn't going to get a single person home faster. So I'd like to ask the Premier, when is he going to clear the air, or is this just going to be another one of those cases where the Premier cuts deals, insiders cash in, and it's the people of Ontario stuck carrying the bag? Members will please take their seat. Minister of Transportation to reply. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition can try to spin it in whatever way she wants, but guess what? We're building Highway 413 and we're building the Bradford Bypass. These are critical projects for this province. They've been on the books for 20 years. The Liberals did absolutely nothing. They didn't want to build in this province. We are in record gridlock. We are in record gridlock today, Mr. Speaker. The City of Toronto ranks as one of the most, uh, uh, one of, as the highest gridlock in the entire, uh, almost in the entire world, Mr. Speaker. In North America, we are the worst, the top three uh, in the world. And guess what? It's because of the inaction of the Liberal government supported by the NDPs. And now what do we have by the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition trying to do? Trying to get in the way of public transit, trying to get in the way of highways. That's a shame, but I'm not surprised. They're beholden to special interests that don't want anything built in this project province, whether that's housing, whether that's transportation, whether that's the hospital programs Bonds. that we are building across this province, over uh, 54 projects that they, they have opposed in their own ridings, in their own communities. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. It's getting a little noisy in here, and I'll remind the members that if they ignore the request of the Speaker to come to order, that uh, the next stage is, of course, uh, warnings, and if they continue to ignore the speaker, they will be named. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. 
Speaker, my question to the President of the Treasury Board. Reporting reveals that the Premier personally asked the Ministry of Transportation to look at changing the route of the Bradford Bypass through the Greenbelt. This request was conveyed to Ryan Amato, who was at that time this Minister's Director of Stakeholder Relations. So it's highly unusual that the Premier would ask a staffer to make such a significant change to the route of a major highway without consulting the Minister herself. We know that the route was changed, so my question through you, Mr. Speaker, is what did the President of the Treasury Board know about this request when she was Minister of Transportation, and when did she know it? Reply for the government, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the Bradford Bypass will save commuters 35 minutes each way. That is the progress that those members are trying to oppose. What a shame. They lack a vision for this province. They lack a vision to build Ontario, and that's why they will remain in that side of the House, Mr. Speaker. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are going to build Ontario for the next 50 to 100 years. We're building important infrastructure projects. Unfortunately, the Liberals did absolutely nothing in their 15 years to do anything to support the growth of this province, but we're investing in critical infrastructure, like the 413, like the Bradford Bypass. That project alone will support over 2,000 jobs during construction, Mr. Speaker. That is the type of progress that they want to eliminate in this, in this province. They are losing construction workers every single day in their opposition, uh, in their opposition to these projects. Spons. Whether we're talking about tunneling, whether we're talking about the Bradford Bypass, the Highway 413, these are good paying jobs that those members over there oppose, but this government will continue to build for the future. Supplementary question. Here, many important questions remain unanswered, and I'm sure that the President of the Treasury Board has those answers if she would stand up. Freedom of information requests turned up almost no records on major highway decisions that will cost taxpayers billions and billions of dollars. This paints a picture of a Minister of Transportation who was intentionally looking away. So again, I ask the President of the Treasury Board, through you, Mr. Speaker, why is a staffer who the Integrity Commissioner described as untrained and unsupervised making decisions about changing the route of the Bradford Bypass instead of this minister herself. Members will please take their seats. Mr. Transportation. Speaker, the decision was made by the people of this province when they elected us on a historic majority mandate for our second term. That was a mandate to build the Bradford Bypass. That was a mandate to build Highway 413, Mr. Speaker. Those members over there should look at their caucus. It's shrinking, Mr. Speaker. They've lost three by-elections because they continue to oppose projects that will support everyday Ontarians. We're going to be creating thousands of jobs, good uh, paying jobs, in our, uh, whether it be through building the Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass, $100 billion invested in both public transit and highways across this province. They are opposing good paying jobs. They are opposing progress in this province, Mr. Speaker, but that doesn't shock me, Mr. They are beholden to special interests that don't want anything built. Whether it's a hospital, whether it's a highway, Response. whether it's public transit, they will always oppose progress in the province of Ontario, but we will continue to get shovel. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order. The next question, the member for Peterborough, coordinate. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy and Electrification. Oh, great Minister. The Trudeau-Crombie Trudeau -Crombie carbon tax Ooh. is making life more expensive for families and businesses Shame. all Shame. across Shame. Ontario. Shame. People in my riding at Peterborough Kawartha are burdened with higher costs for everything from groceries to home heating and vehicle gas. I have people in North Kawartha that have to travel at times 40 or 50 kilometers just to get their groceries. Wow. And they pay more because of the carbon tax. Every single day. Speaker, the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP may be happy with the status quo, but our government knows that Ontarians have had enough. Exactly. They want solutions, not tax hike after tax hike after tax hike. And they definitely Question. don't want an additional tax for municipalities. 
Speaker, can the minister please explain how the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is impacting Ontario families and what our government is doing to protect these families from the escalating costs? That's a good question. Of energy and electrification. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Peterborough for standing up for common sense in this House. We believe that the Liberal carbon tax is making life more uh, unaffordable for the people of Ontario. In fact, 25 per cent of energy bills in this province now are a result are being driven up as a result of the carbon tax. $25 billion are taken out of our economy because of Liberal carbon tax and because of the former Liberal policies People in this province, working families and seniors, paid $1,000 more each and every year. We know that we must uh, prioritize affordable energy. That's why we introduced the Affordable Energy Act that codifies in law that this government will use competitive procurements, not ideology, to ensure we have the lowest rates available to incent investment and to keep rates down for our families. Mr. Speaker, the Affordable Energy Act is an enabler of conservation what? issues. It expands nuclear energy. and it ensures we keep the lights on and the rates low for the people of this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that uh, response. Manufacturers, farmers and small businesses are being forced to deal with rising operating costs driven by higher Liberal taxes. Speaker, the Liberal members in this House and their federal colleagues don't seem to understand that higher taxes are hurting working class people. In fact, they've even suggested another 1% retail sales tax. All of this sets people back. That's why Ontario families and businesses are looking to our government for an affordable energy future, with nuclear energy playing a critical role. They want government to prioritize affordability first and foremost. Speaker, can the minister please outline how the government will advance non-emitting nuclear energy to keep energy affordable and reliable for the Ontario families and businesses? Oh, good question. Minister of Energy and Electric. Thank you, Speaker. You know, nuclear energy was the pivotal enabler of what allowed our province to displace coal energy a decade ago. We need non-emitting nuclear energy to ensure we deliver an affordable energy future for the people of Ontario. But let's reflect on what transpired over the past years in this province. It was the Liberals and the NDP who started and stopped the Darlington nuclear station. It was the Liberals who tried to put an end to the Pickering nuclear generating station that produces two thousand megawatts of non-emitting clean power for the people of Ontario. For two million families depend on it. 4,500 jobs depend on Pickering alone. Mr. Speaker, we know that we are leading the largest nuclear energy expansion on the continent because it is affordable and because it is clean and because it produces reliable 24-7 enduring power that our economy requires. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to invest in non-emitting sources of energy so we deliver affordability for the people of this province. Thank you. The next question. The member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour le Premier ministre. Mr. President, my question is from Prime Minister. That the opioid death rate in Sault Ste. Marie is the highest in all of Ontario, over 64 mm. deaths per 100,000. Mayor Shoemaker had this to say. Timmins was perennially higher than us, and when they got a supervised consumption site, things seem to stabilize and improve for them. We were in the process of preparing a supervised consumption site. We never got one. That's, in my view, why our stats didn't improve." End of quote. What is the Premier doing to keep the people of Sault Ste. Marie and Algoma alive right now? Mm -hmm. Member for Essex and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Speaker, the member makes reference to drug injection sites, and let me tell you, we have heard the message loud and clear from the mothers and the fathers of the province of Ontario. They are tired of stepping over needles when they walk their children to school. They are tired, Mr. Speaker. They are tired of seeing their children exposed to drug activity. They are tired of the violence that the drug injection sites attract. They are tired of the drug activity and trafficking that the drug injection sites attract. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, this government is imposing a 200-meter protection zone around every school and every child care facility. 
in the province of Ontario because we don't want drugs and we don't want used needles anywhere near the children of the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, throughout Northern Ontario, opioid deaths are sky high. Thunder Bay and Timmins will lose their consumption and treatment site in Sudbury, where you refuse, where this government refused to fund consumption and treatment site. Overdose deaths continue to rise nonstop. I will be attending a funeral on Saturday. One more of my friends died of an overdose. Every single day, seven people in Ontario died from this overdose opioid epidemic. So I asked the Minister, the Premier, what is the Premier going to do now to keep Northerners alive? Thank you. Members, please take their seats. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you, the government has and continues to make investments in, in, in ensuring that we build a, a system of treatment and recovery, not just in Southern Ontario, but in Northern Ontario as well. In fact, the Addiction Recovery Fund opened. 54% of the funding went to Northern Ontario. It went to cities like Thunder Bay, like Sudbury, like Timmins, like Sioux Lookout. And those investments so far have opened up 280 beds, the Addiction Recovery Fund. It's created 10,000 treatment spots for individuals that didn't exist before, and our government is continuing to make those investments with the heart hubs that will be opening hopefully very soon as well. The continuum of care belongs in the community, Bonds. and everyone wants treatment and recovery, not to be kept on a substance and, and, and continuing to use. They want to be treated, and that's what we're doing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor, to come see. Thank you, Speaker. So uh, my, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation oh, and Trade. So, um, my home of Windsor to come see is the place that drives Ontario's economy. And it's home to hardworking families and a thriving auto sector because of our government's leadership and investments. But the success we see in Windsor to come see isn't just built here at home. It's also deeply tied to trade with the United States. This trade supports good paying jobs in Windsor's factories, warehouses, and small businesses. It fuels our local economy and keeps our workers employed. Given how interlinked Ontario's economy is with the United States, the people of my riding have watched the U.S. election with uncertainty about what this will mean for the future. Question. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to ensure that Ontario-U.S. relations continue to thrive with a new administration south of the border? The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much. Well, we can start uh, by following the Premier's uh, uh, foot forward on offering congratulations to President-elect Trump and to Vice President-elect Vance. Pre Speaker, we have a long and enduring uh, and very important relationship with the United States. It's built on our strong economic ties. It's built on our shared values and our integrated supply chains, which are most uh, uh, important to the member from Windsor. There are millions of people on both sides of the border who are counting on us here in Ontario to build on these opportunities, Speaker, our manufacturing, our critical minerals, and our energy. Speaker, this, these are the issues that will uh, be most prominent to the Americans. We continue. We'll be back in Washington Spons. in December. We'll be back in Washington in January. And if you listen to Premier Ford, he will tell you, bet big on Ontario. Yeah. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Now, our government has shown that we will work with elected officials of all political stripes. And since we took office, we've seen a Republican president and a Democrat president. Now, the political makeup of the Senate and the House of Representatives has changed numerous times. 
governors and legislatures of states that are key trading partners to Ontario have also changed. But one thing that hasn't changed is our government's ability to work with everyone we need to to ensure Ontario's economy continues to thrive. Speaker, can the Minister please expand on the importance of the Ontario-US economic relationship and highlight what else we are doing to ensure this relationship continues to remain strong? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, we have such a, as I mentioned earlier, this long and storied history with the United States. It is now built to the point where we do $500 billion a year in two-way trade. The interesting point of that is not only are we the American's third largest trading partner after Mexico, China, and us, the fact is, it's almost two-way, it's almost 50-50 compared to one way in Mexico and one way in China. Uh, it is a two-way trade here. But not only is it $500 billion a year in two-way trade, we are the number one trading partner to 17 U.S. states. We're the number two trading partner to 11 more U.S. states. This. Can, the Premier talks about adopting Can-Am, a Canadian-American approach. And, Speaker, again, continue to bet big on Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Premier. Every year, workers in Ontario are hospitalized because of heat stress. Some of them may die. They deserve protection from injury, from death. Today, our party will be introducing a bill to provide workers with on-the-job protection from heat stress and stroke. The Premier could increase protections for workers right now. The OFL supports this bill. Will he vote for it? Members will please take their seats. The Parliamentary Assistant the Minister of Labour and Member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. Worker safety is top priority for our ministry. Every worker in Ontario deserves to be safe and protected from workplace hazards, including heat stress. Under OSHA, employers and supervisors have a duty to take every precaution reasonable in circumstances for the perfection of a worker, including the protection in hot environments. The employer should establish a heat stress control plan for the summer to manage job risk associated with high temperatures and humidity. Our ministry provided $250,000 in funding to the occupational health clinics for Ontario workers to develop a stress test toolkit to support workers to address the heat conditions in their workplaces, assess the risk for heat stress, and be proactive to take uh, steps to protect workers. Every worker in Ontario has the Response. right to refuse work they believe to be unsafe and are encouraged to risk support to their conditions to health and safety. Thank you. Supplementary, the member of Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the member knows full well that precariously employed workers and even workers with relatively secure jobs are not going to risk their livelihood by refusing to work when it is too hot to work safely. Worker protection must be proactive and must be the responsibility of the employer who has the ability to provide these protections and safeguards. Will the government support our legislation to protect the lives of workers today? Please take their seat. And the member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario continues to have a strong health and safety record, and our ministry is committed to maintaining these standards for all workers in our province. We have a preventative, proactive approach to prevent workplace hazards and enforce OSHA for the protection of safety for all. Our strategy for occupational health and safety programs, Prevention Works, aims to continue to support Ontario, and we remain a leader in occupational health and safety. We will continue to protect workers and make sure our province remains the best place to work, live, and raise a family. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Orleans. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, here in Ontario, the most prosperous province in the country, there are two and a half million of our neighbours without a family doctor, and that number wow. is only wow. getting bigger. This wow. Conservative government has increased the provincial debt by over $100 billion. So we have to wonder, where is all that money going, Mr. Speaker? In Ottawa, there are at least 160,000 residents without a family doctor. Residents like Teresa, who spent years on wait lists for a doctor to help manage her yet undiagnosed medical issue. She finally got rostered, Mr. Speaker. Three months later, the doctor promptly left Ontario for greener pastures somewhere else in Canada. Now, Teresa is now spending her time bouncing between walking clinics, putting her employment in jeopardy while she awaits yet another family doctor. And and there are millions of stories like Teresa's, Mr. Speaker, in the most prosperous province in the country, with a government that spends billions like it's monopoly money, why are so many Ontarians, like Teresa, stuck without a family doctor? Government side will come to order. The member for Essex in Parliament. Mr. Bell. Speaker, of course, people like Theresa need primary care and deserve primary care. We want to provide that to everybody in Ontario, and in fact, approximately 90 per cent of the residents in Ontario have access to primary care and are connected with primary care. Some of that is provided by the fantastic nurse practitioners in the province of Ontario, and I note once again a Liberal member has stood up and refused to acknowledge that nurse practitioners actually deliver primary care. I don't know why the Liberals don't have any recognition of nurse order. practitioners, but let's talk Independent a little bit more members about come to that. order. There are 296 interprofessional primary care teams in Ontario with nurse, nurse practitioners serving 4 million clients. Why won't the Liberals recognize that? What have they got against nurse Response. practitioners? Nurse practitioners are delivering great care, patient-focused care, team-based care. We believe in that. Why don't the Liberals? Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Transportation will come to order. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what? This government will blame whomever they want. They might even go back and blame Tommy Douglas for creating Medicare, Mr. Speaker. But they've had six years to get it done, and the problem is worse now than when they started. 2,000 people getting health care every day in the hallway. 200,000 people waiting for surgery or a diagnostic procedure. 11,000 of those people dying while they wait, Mr. Speaker. In the Premier's own backyard, in the great state of Etobicoke, there are 93,000 people without a family doctor. That's one in four residents of the Premier's riding without a doctor, Mr. Speaker. By the time the next election is Order. scheduled, those 93,000 people will join over 4 million Ontarians without a family doctor. The government has had six years to get it done and make things better, but it's only gotten worse. Can the Premier tell us Question. and all residents of Ontario why he thinks we should give him even more time to make it worse? Transportation will come to order. Minister of Red Tape Production will come to order. The Minister of Long-Term Care will come to order. The Premier may reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, maybe the member from Orleans Ottawa can South answer, will come to order. Mr. Speaker, maybe the member from Orleans can answer the question. Why did their party, when they were in power, they cut residency spots as we've increased them by 40 percent? You never built, built any medical schools, and we have TMU, we have York, we have U of T. We've added seats in a Northern uh, University and in Ottawa, right in your own backyard. Why didn't the previous Liberal government build a new hospital in your area? Because you never did. We're built, we are building the second largest hospital in Canada in their area. I want to know through the member, why did you fire nurses? Why did you fire nurses under the Liberal government as we brought on 80,000 new nurses, 30,000 more nurses in colleges? Thank you. Stop the clock. We will take a seat. And I'll remind the Premier to make his comments through the chair when he's answering questions. Thank you very much. Start the clock. The next member to ask a question, the member for Bay of Quinty. Thank you, Speaker. My question
question is for the Minister of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Our government has a deep respect and gratitude for the extraordinary courage and tremendous sacrifices our veterans have made in service to our country. But, Speaker, we also recognize the complex challenges veterans often face when transitioning back into civilian life. Many of them continue to face significant hurdles finding stable, meaningful employment, including in my riding of Bay of Quinte, as we're host to CFB Trenton and all the great men and women who serve there. Today and every day, thank you for your service. Our government must continue to support Ontario's veterans and ensure they have access to the resources they need to build rewarding, long-term careers after their service. In light of these challenges, Speaker, could the Minister tell the House what our government is doing to support our veterans and to facilitate their success? successful integration into Ontario's civilian economy. The member for Ajax and parliamentary assistant. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the men and women that serve our country. Our Ontario's veterans have a wealth of skills that they can directly be translated into so many sectors within our economy. Part of this is our skilled trades. Our ministry is committed to committed, creating clear pathways for veterans into these roles. We're investing millions in creating opportunities and pathways for our veterans and our heroes. For example, our government is investing $3 million over three years in Helmets and Hard Hats Canada, to regis a registered nonprofit organization that provides second career opportunities to the, in the construction industry to those in military Safety and training, they provide peer counseling for serving members of the Canadian Armed Forces, veterans and military families. This investment will help hundreds of Canadian Armed Forces members transition into civilian life Spons. and prepare for rewarding and new careers in the construction sectors. Services will help fill a gap in Ontario's employment and training resources while addressing the unique needs and experiences of veterans, military... Thank you very much. In the supplementary, back to the member for Bay of Quinty. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Parliamentary Assistant for highlighting these crucial supports for our veterans and for all the great work that she does. While job training is invaluable, we recognize that veterans often need more personalized assistance to navigate the intricacies of Ontario's job market. Adjusting to civilian life can present unique challenges, and it's essential that our government provides resources that are relevant, effective, and directly informed by the veterans' own experiences and insights. By involving veterans in these discussions, we can ensure that Ontario is delivering meaningful support that will allow our veterans to not only secure employment, but also grow, thrive, and advance in their chosen careers over the long term. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please elaborate on our government's efforts to engage directly with veterans to help us identify which career development resources Question. are most beneficial to them? Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member again for that question. And it gives you the opportunity to highlight to our government's unwavering support for veterans and their families. We know that for veterans transitioning to civilian life and for their families relocated in Ontario can bring unique challenges, particularly when it comes to employment. Our government has taken real decisive action to address these challenges. Through comprehensive consultations, we have listened directly to the veterans and military spouses about the employment barriers that they face. We have implemented the Soldiers' Aid Commission, which is also essential in our strategy for providing critical financial support to veterans and their families who need it the most. Here, here. Whether it's housing, specialized equipment, mental health resources, or employment support, we're making sure veterans have access to the resources necessary Spons. for a stable, successful, and transition to civilian life. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kiwetnong. Miigwetza, Speaker. I'm in the The chief and uh, leadership from uh, of Anjanong, First Nation, are here today. Uh, Anjanong has endured more than a century of environmental racism as industrial pollution has turned their land into one of the Canada's most polluted areas. Speaker Anjanong uh, has asked the Lambton Industrial Meteorological Alert air quality regulation to be updated for years now. Can the minister explain why these regulations have not been updated? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I'm uh, pleased uh, to answer the question as Acting Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks this morning. Our government's dedication to protecting human health and the environment is clear, particularly when it comes to First Nations and our shared goals. And I can tell the member, through you, uh, Speaker, that Ministers Kanjan and Rickford spoke with Chief Plain in April of this year, uh, have addressed the concerns of Amgenon, and will continue to do so and welcome further consultation and participation in exchanges. In fact, we introduced a new regulation to set out strict benzene emissions limits for INEOS and introduce the ability for the province to levy fines for exceedances. We took immediate action last spring to hold the company responsible by issuing four provincial officers' orders requiring them to address benzene exceedances. In early May 2024, Response. we issued a notice of suspension and amended the facility's environmental compliance authorization. They are out of business and they will remain out of business. The supplementary question. Miigwech, Speaker, the, the regulations have not been updated. That's the issue today. Speaker, for decades, both Ontario and Canada have ignored the severe impact of pollution on the health of Amsterdam. What they do is they sidestep their responsibility by claiming the issue falls outside of their jurisdictions. Speaker, again, Amgenong are here because this government needs to take the real steps to address the industrial harms threatening the ways of life of their people. Will this request be honored or ignored? Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, as the Acting Minister of the Environment, I can say clearly we recognize Amgenon's First Nations' long-standing concerns about the impacts of air pollution in their community, and we share the same goal, the common cause of a clean environment. That's why our ministry continues to meet with that community on a regular basis to discuss these concerns and ensure they are addressed appropriately. In April of 2024, we added two additional real-time benzene monitors at priority locations in that community to ensure 24-7 air monitoring to support the community. We are fully committed to working with that First Nations community and all First Nations community, local health agencies and industries on timely resolutions to air quality concerns. This is a common cause for all. We are all in this together. Count on us to continue to dialogue and work towards solutions. Thank you very much. Member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I was first elected back in 2020, the very first person to walk through my, my office door in Ottawa was someone looking for a family doctor. And Mr. Speaker, four years later, my office is only getting more of those calls every day. Just recently, I had an elderly couple contact me obviously very distressed because their doctor was leaving the profession due to burnout. This couple requires regular care and medications renewal to help manage the serious health conditions they're dealing with. Now, they're worried that they won't be able to get those medications renewal and the care that they need on time. Mr. Speaker, this situation is only one example of a long list of people who struggle who worry and who are asking me to try to convince the government to do whatever is necessary to ensure access to timely Question. care. Mr. Speaker, it's been six years since the government was elected. Will the Premier please tell the 22,000 people in my riding of Ottawa Vanier and the 2.5 million people across Ontario who do not have a family doctor when they will finally be able to get the primary health care service they need in the Member for Essex and Parliamentary Assistant Minister Moore. Speaker, of course, when the Liberals ran the government, they reduced the number of doctors being trained in the province of Ontario. We're not going to repeat that mistake. Order. They also caused nurses to get laid off and fired. We're not going to repeat that mistake either. 
Rather, what we're going to do is continuing connecting people to primary care. Approximately 90 percent of everybody in Ontario has a connection to a primary care provider. And that is according to CAIHI, which is the statistics agency that records those facts. CAIHI also says that Ontario is doing better than any other province in the country. We're doing better than Alberta, better than Manitoba, and better than Saskatchewan, and better than all the other provinces. But, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to stop there. We've hired Response. Jane Philpott, a recognized expert in the field, to continue this progress in connecting people in the province of Ontario to primary care. Thank you. South will come to order. The Minister of Colleges and Universities will come to order. Supplementary question. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, being able to communicate clearly with your doctor is so important for obvious reasons. Uh, unfortunately, for Francophones in Ontario, finding a doctor who can provide care in their language is very difficult. The simplest example that comes to mind is my 80-year-old mother, who understands English to a certain extent but could not describe her symptoms in English. The risk of not having access to a bilingual or French-speaking doctor is that she could very well fall victim to a misdiagnosis or an appropriate treatment. And this is the case for a significant number of Franco-Ontarians because we don't have a robust system for identifying doctors capable of working in French. Can the Minister of Francophone Affairs, who is responsible for supplying those services under the French Language Services Act, tell us how the government intends to ensure that every Franco-Ontarian can find a bilingual or French-speaking family doctor? Member for Essex. Monsieur le Président, comme je... Mr. President, as I said previously, we are not going to repeat the same mistakes that were made by the Liberal Party. We're not going to repeat the same mistakes that were made by the Liberal government. We're going to continue to train medical doctors in the province of Ontario, and we will keep attracting new doctors and train them in new universities like the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, or where doctors will be trained to help support the northern populations to have access to primary care. And I would also like to add that in the city of Ottawa, we will add 6,400 new people that will be able to have access to primary care. And this is very important because those are people who need to have access to primary care, and they will be able to do so. Uh, via clinics, uh, by, uh, by, uh, the, by a clinic that is a nurse practitioner-led clinic. Thank you, Mr. President. Question. The member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. You know, hate has no place in our province, but sadly, it continues to rear its ugly head time and time again. Whether it's anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, or any form of hatred, it leaves deep scars on our communities. Ontario is home to so many people of so many backgrounds and beliefs. These differences make us stronger not weaker. But when people feel unsafe in their place of worship, cultural center, or college and university, it shakes the very foundation of our society. Ontarians deserve better. They deserve to practice their faith and live their culture without fear. That's why it's so important for our government to act. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is taking action to protect faith-based and cultural communities from hate? The Parliamentary Assistant, member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is right. Hate has no place in Ontario, and our government will not tolerate any form of hate in our province. Very simply, no tolerance for intolerance. Everyone, regardless of their faith, how they worship God, or where they came from, deserve to feel safe and secure at our province places of worship and cultural organizations. For example, after the tragedy of October 7th, we began to see the concerning rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Working with our local Jewish and Muslim communities, our government acted swiftly, investing an additional $20 million in anti-hate security and prevention grant program 
in 2023 and 2024 to ensure Ontarians can practice their faith safely, securely and free from intimidation, harassment or hate. Speaker, these are more than just dollars amount. We continue to see the real impacts on this, of these grants in local communities across Ontario. 1,682 unique faith-based and culture organizations have been funded through this grant, with majority of them respected that the grant helped providing an increased sense of safety for their places of worship and reduce incidents of hate. Ms. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. People should not have to look over their shoulder when they're praying or celebrating their culture. Far too many people still face these threats, harassment and violence, simply because of who they are, where they come from or how they worship. Places of worship and cultural centres and colleges and universities should be sanctuaries where people feel safe and welcome. Sadly, certain individuals attempt to disrupt the sense of safety, and we need to ensure that every Ontarian, no matter their faith or background, can live without fear. Our communities have called for more support to protect these spaces. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please tell us how this grant will continue to support our communi communities and help them stay safe? Another from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate my colleague concerns our government to remain committed to working with our local communities to ensure places of worship are protected and those who are attending feel safe and secure. That's why I'm glad to share that on October 31st, applications opened for this year anti-hate and security, security and prevention grant and will be open until December 2nd. Speaker, this grant has served diverse communities across the province, including Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Indigenous, Sikh and LGBTQ organizations. Funding from this grant have been used on a variety of safety initiatives, including installing security cameras, better locks and doors, reinforcement windows, undertaking security assessments, and more. This is clear need to continue providing the source, the resources to safeguard these institutions, and our government remain committed to doing just that. We will not stop working Response. to build stronger, safer, and more thriving province, where everyone is able freely and securely worship and express their faith. Thank you very much. The next question, a member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, construction of the Finch West LRT has not been easy for my community. Over the many years, there have been delays, lane closures within active construction, a never-ending traffic disruption, both vehicle and pedestrian accidents, including a tragic fatality, a collapsed underground parking garage, a daycare flooded with sewage, and more. As you can imagine, the news that construction of the Finch West LRT has finally ended was greeted with exhausted relief by my community. But Speaker, there's still no opening date. Mm. So when will the Finch West LRT be open so we can get Finch moving? Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, it's incredibly obvious that when the Liberals and the NDP were in power, they built absolutely nothing. They had a chance to build rapid transit. They had a chance to build our highways and they simply failed to do so, right? right? Our transit riders got stuck on a regular basis. The Finch LRT will be giving those in Northwest Toronto what they wanted for a very long time, a transit system that offers more choices to travel on their own schedule. It will connect the Finch West subway station to Hubbard College, and it will reduce the TTC bus traffic Order. on Finch Ave West, particular during peak travel times. I'm happy to say that testing is currently on schedule, and we hope to have an update for the, the, the people soon. We will keep building. Member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. A supplementary question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. 
While this Premier continues to have, to have his temper tantrum on Toronto, stripping away municipalities' decision-making powers and wasting taxpayer dollars, unnecessarily ripping up bike lanes, he continues to fail at the very basics of completing our Eglinton LRT, which, if ever opened, would actually address gridlock in our community of St. Paul's. This Premier has had over six years to finish this transit project, cutting across our Midtown and Little Jamaica community. Recently, the Premier told the media he'd get involved as a last resort, quote unquote, if delays persist. Then, despite the project being absurdly over budget and years delay, he continued to literally fanboy over the Metrolink CEO, Phil Verster. <laughs> Literally. So, Speaker, my okay. question is to the Premier. Will this Premier stop fanboying over failed management and give my community residents and small businesses transit that works? Thank you, Speaker. The Eglinton West Extension will bring even more rapid transit to communities all along the Eglinton Avenue from the east end of Toronto and into Mississauga. This seven-stop subway project will support as many as 4,600 jobs annually and establish connectivity with the airport employment zone, Canada's second largest employment hub. Our government is focused on rapidly building the transit projects that Ontarians need, and our plan is working. Tunneling is halfway complete, and under the Premier Ford's leadership, we are full steam ahead and getting it done. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.